Okay, let's get this show on the road. And um, what I'd like to do is, is announce that the Twin Cities section is providing a tech talk or technical program uh, about applying ISA slash IEC 62443 to a unified namespace architecture. And the unified namespace UNS for short is quickly becoming the preferred architecture for digital transformation initiatives in manufacturing. However, there are concerns about how to maintain a robust cybersecurity posture. Most integrated control systems, otherwise known as ICS, use the so-called Purdue model. But what does this mean for a UNS architecture that's so new? And how do manufacturers connect new sources of data quickly and securely? This webinar will cover the basics of designing a UNS, how to architect the system and apply the 62443 standard to ensure it is secure. Rather than a hypothetical system, it will show a, demo, a demonstration of a system that was designed for this purpose. Tonight's uh, webinar is being presented by David Schultz, who's a principal consultant with Spruik Technologies. Spruik Technologies. He works with manufacturers to help them develop and execute strategies for their digital transformation and asset management initiatives. He has, 25, he has over 25 years of automation and process control experience across many market verticals with a focus on continuous and batch processing. He's the director elect for the SMIIOT division of ISA and serves on several technical committees. He is also a member of the Society of Maintenance and Reliability Professionals known as SMRP and the Project Management Institute also known as PMI. So uh, while you are all here virtually, let's uh, welcome Dave to uh, our Twin Cities section. And thank you, Dave, for doing the presentation tonight. Yeah, it's my pleasure. As you're reading that, I'm like going, wow, this, this guy sounds pretty smart. And then I realize, oh, wait, he's talking about me. So <laughs> you can always make things sound pretty good on paper if you really want to. Um, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to come in and present. There's been a lot of conversation around you know, a unified namespace, how to secure a unified namespace, uh, you know, going back and forth. And as a systems integrator, I get involved in a lot of these uh, types of conversations of as we put in this modern architecture, how do we ensure that we can keep it secure? Um, because one of the things we learned during COVID now is, is everybody's now moving off site. We have remote access to data and it's giving a lot of people pause. And one of the features of the industry 4.0 and the, the digital transformation that's going around uh, or going along with that is we're now getting more and more data that is being sent to places that it hasn't previously been sent before. And while wow, that's creating a whole lot of heartburn. So how do we how do we like I said earlier, how do we make sure that we keep all this secure and keep the bad actors out, but the data flowing is as easily as we can. So before we get started, um, I just want to preface this that I am not an expert uh, on 62443 standard. Um, I would be hard pressed to even say that I'm a practitioner of it in a in a formal sense. That said, I'm well aware of the things that need to go involved or that are involved in securing an industrial control system. And you know, I just I want to make sure that we're we're providing this in the framework of where we're going with that. So um, just real fast and agenda slide. So we're going to go over a little bit of a definition just so we're all on the same page as far as what a unified namespace is and then understanding you know, how we go ahead and, and architect something like that. Um, I'm going to walk through the development of what is involved in a unified namespace. So once it gets defined, then how do we actually develop something like a unified namespace? And then finally, what is the architecture? What are the some of the sort of the rules of thumb that we want to follow when we start connecting all of this data. Because the idea is that we want to be able to take our intelligence and connect it to technology and, and make sure that as we exponentially create more of intelligence within in a manufacturing organization, that that can quickly and easily get consumed by uh, other systems that might uh, be of interest in it. So let's start off real fast in defining a, a unified namespace. So. You've probably heard that the unified namespace, it is the single source of uh, truth for all your data and events, and it follows the structure of your business. So what is what is meant by that? So when we talk about the single source of truth, most people will understand that and we get into the old control system or a SCADA supervisory control and data acquisition. 
most people are aware of it in the context of your real-time data. So this is going to be all of your um, uh, primary variables of your control system. So if you're, you know, regardless of whatever it is that you're manufacturing, you will have automated equipment. There is a set point that is something should be um, operating at. And then there's the actual, what's the actual value that's there. And if you look at it over, a, you know, a series of time, this is where you get those trend charts and that's that real time data that you're getting. So from a unified namespace, that's very easily understood. But there's also transactions that occur within a manufacturing organization organization um, as well as events. So transactions are, um, I have a new work order that's been created by my ERP in this instance, your enterprise resource planning system. You know, that that is an event that has occurred, but then there's some data that needs to get um, pushed to other systems that are going to want to consume it. So um, in this example, it might be a manufacturing execution system that's, oh, there's a new work order. I need to schedule it. I need to get it brought into a line. So it's all of those events that are occur um, that you want to make sure that you're capturing um, a, a semantic data model as it comes through a, uh, uh, you know, through this UNS in a, um, you know, typically we're going to use a uh, an MQTT broker for this, but we want to use a publish and subscribe. So there's an event driven architecture um, that follows through that. So again, single source of truth for all data and events. The structure of your business generally follows the equipment model as it's presented in the ISA 95 standard. And I have uh, another slide that actually uh, gives you know a quick highlight of what is meant by that. So all of the data and events that's moving through, that they're creating these semantic data models of both real time and events and transactions. We're getting all of that data presented in a um, in, in following that equipment model. So the data that's presented, if, say if it's down on a line or down at a cell, that that information exists within a namespace that is relevant to that. So that's what I mean by creating these semantic data models and a hierarchy. And it's really what we're doing is creating this event driven architecture, which is a fancy way of saying we want to use publish and subscribe technologies rather than a pull response. Most of the time, many control systems, or at least historically, have been on that pull response. Um, if you think about, say, like an OPC server, that server is constantly pulling, um, say, a PLC that's sitting out on the line, and that PLC is responding with that data. In this case, we actually want to have the event, or excuse me, the, the PLC driving that event of there's new information that's available to you. I'm going to publish it so that there, there isn't that pull response. So that's what's meant by a, um, a pub sub or an event driven architecture. So unified namespace, single source of truth for all your data and events. You want to follow the structure of your business, make sure the data exists in, in a uh, contextualized framework, and then utilize a, uh, an event-driven architecture. Um, you put all those things together and you have a unified namespace. For the people that are familiar with ISA 95, um, this is that a typical, your uh, hierarchy or your role-based equipment model. So you will hear people oftentimes talk about enterprise, site, area, line, and cell. Well, this actually comes from part one of that standard, although the equipment models are part of um, the, the part two. Um, this is where it's actually enumerated within the standard. It's one of the data models out of the 100 or so models in ISA 95 that are enumerated and spelled out. And most people will understand this. So information that exists at your enterprise. I talk about a new work order that was created at uh, within your ERP. Your ERP is probably a, a enterprise based role within your equipment model. So you're going to have say new work order is going to be part of that. It's going to sit inside of that namespace that's uh, associated with your enterprise. Versus say that I have a, a process cell that has a set point and there's some data that's coming from it of, you know, I'm supposed to be operating at this temperature. Here's my set point. What is my actual temperature in real time? That information is going to exist down in, say, at the cell namespace in your PLC or your raw data. Um, so these are all the namespaces that get created out of that. But um, as you start creating these, these hierarchical data models, you want to ensure that it, it matches the structure of your business, which generally speaking is based on your ISA 95 equipment models. It does not have to be enterprise site area line cell. Um, it just needs to reflect the overall structure of your business. So if you have business units, if you have um, if you have business groups or you know other roles or organizations of your data structure, those are the types of things that you want to follow. So I know I've just thrown a whole bunch of stuff at you. Um, any questions so far on, on what we've covered? All right, perfect. 
people are very familiar with this model. It also comes from ISA Part 1 or ISA 95 Part 1, but this is what's affectionately known as the Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture. The two things, the thing that is very different about these levels here is that Purdue is all around a function. Purdue focuses on connecting your data together and how you want to actually have your control systems, how those, how the network and topology is set up. Because ideally, you want to be able to operate your level one equipment without having to be, you know, without your level two system being there. And that's how you want to break this equipment out. So understand that the, the Purdue model is based on how you connect all your systems together and what the event horizon or time horizon is around that particular Purdue model or around that particular data. But your ISA 95 is more function or more focused on the role based of what is this equipment supposed to be doing. So it is the function of what it is. Um, and then, of course, most people are familiar with 62443 as in the context of this Purdue model. There's nothing in 6443 that says you have to follow this. There's other things that are supposed to be guidelines just most of the time. Um, that's how we're familiar with it. So when people say Purdue is dead, they say ISA 95 is dead in this new context. You know, those none of those statements are true. We're, we're talking apples and oranges, two very different things. So I, I want to make sure that I'm really driving home the point that your equipment model, ISA 95, is all about its role, its function where this is all around how you get all of your, um, your, your data connected together and how things should be um, connected. So like I said, if you have loss of connectivity, those systems, your plant will still be able to safely operate. So that, that's really the, the kind of the gist of what I'm getting there. So as we get into being systems integrators, most people are very familiar with this traditional model of how we integrate these systems. It's it's based on that Purdue model of here's where all of our events and how fast things are going to occur. Um, now I've put together and, and smerged some of those levels a little bit. So there's a little bit of hand waving, but I did that only so I could make a nice compact view. So you're going to have your devices, all your uh, level zero, level one equipment's going to be sitting there at the bottom, and then they they integrate point to point all the way through the rest of the system. So that you'll have, even though cloud isn't part of the ISA 95 standard, most often we'll have cloud sitting up at the top as we draw these out. Control systems or your HMI SCADA, that, that, that line or that delineation has been... Um, it, it's not as clear as once it, it once was, but I will just we'll call that as or we'll call that as part of your control system. Um, we introduced this concept of this workflow that we can now handle. Okay, if there's a um, a, 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 a a downtime event that has occurred, so that's going to come from our uh, CMMS system. There's a process and a procedure for how do we actually get, um, you know, what what are the steps that have to be taken to um, actually execute this particular order. But where this is important is that historically when people have integrated these systems based on a Purdue model, it's, as I said earlier, it's this point-to-point -point integration where my PLC will connect to my SCADA, that'll connect into my NES, that'll connect into my ERP. And every time that there's new intelligence that's created, that has to be integrated all the way through the, the process. And one of the challenges of following that same um, architecture is that as you exponentially add in more and more intelligence, you're going to run out of time and you're going to run out of, of money before you actually get all of that data connected. So there needs to be a much um, faster way to get all this information um, shared across the organization. And that's where we get into the concept of a unified namespace. So typically in a unified namespace architecture, there's going to be an MQTT broker that is sitting in the middle um, and there can be more than one. So keep in mind that there are namespaces that then make up the unified namespace, but we're going to use this broker and it's event driven architecture to start connecting all this data. So I can connect intelligence into this unified namespace and that needs to, to reside and that data needs to be modeled um, in a way that others can readily consume it. So as this, um, you know, I'm a device, I know what intelligence I have, I'm going to present my intelligence in a way that is going to be meaningful to everything else, you know, knowing that I am the, I'm the owner of this data, I know when my data changes. Um, 
and that's how I'm going to present it so that any one of these nodes in that ecosystem can consume from that data. So if there is a change in a PLC tag that is related to temperature, that might drive other operations. So for instance, out of my CRM, I might be utilizing some role-based maintenance where there's going to be three tags that hmm, every time I see this, that means somebody needs to go do something. So as a CRM, or excuse me, as a, um, I'm sorry, not my CRM, my CMMS uh, for my maintenance system, um, that I know there's going to be a work order coming, I can actually get that scheduled. So rather than integrating that data in through my SCADA and then in through my CMMS, I'm actually going to have that information that's available to my CMMS to dynamically create that. And that's the whole idea behind this event-driven architecture, um, behind having nodes in an ecosystem. So earlier I was talking about ISA 95 and how that is role-based. That is all considered or all um, concerned about what is the function of this particular data? What is the function of this system um, in the context of what it is that I'm doing? And there's nothing within ISA 95 that says I can't do something like this. It's traditionally we have understood that integration through that Purdue and the ISA 95. The point here is that you still have these this data that's connected together. You still have an event driven architecture. You still organize that data and that that um, equipment, that role based equipment hierarchy so that the data resides at the place that it makes sense. But you're still going to, to uh, publish and subscribe to all that information. Um, so that other systems can consume that information, add in their intelligence, and publish that information um, back out in real time. So, question here, Dave. Um, yes, playing a little devil's advocate here, um, as you mentioned, the Re Purdue reference model, mm -hmm. and show the diagrams with the lower level hardware, and 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 then of course levels of hardware and levels of function. Um, can you give us some feel for whether our traditional PLC tags are fit into this unified namespace, or mm -hmm. does this take over for tags-based system? Because mm -hmm. they're they're all part of an event-driven architecture as well. So tell us what's different yeah. about UNS versus the old tag approach. Yeah. So when you're in tags, if all of a sudden I come up with you know from ISA, it's, what is it ISA? Five, is that right? Where you have the, the naming convention for something. So it's your unit. And then it's like it's a temperature indicating transmitter and then it has a name to it. But that's for all intents and purposes what it what a tag is. It's it's, you know, a T or a temp, you know, 4283. Well, what does that actually mean? So you're going to have this raw namespace that is going to be your tags that you are going to consume and you're going to create this semantic data model that's going to say, oh, that is my filler temperature in my my third nozzle, so to speak. So that's where you're going to take that tag based information, but you're going to invert that into a, a unified namespace, that semantic data model that gives you that information about it. And you're not only going to get its value, you're also going to get some units of measurement. You're going to have a well, let's call it a smart tag that's associated with it. So as you start integrating with tags that exist in PLCs, this is really one of the easiest things to do, and that's another slide that I'll show you, is that we typically start off modeling assets because that's the most readily consumable and understood within a unified namespace. So that PLC tag is going to be based there. So no longer being that to that temp 6243 or whatever that number is that I, that I made up earlier, that's now going to be my filler temperature in nozzle six um, in my overall hierarchy. So I'm in this plant. I'm in this area and on this particular line in this particular unit, um, and that's now going to be my temperature. And you'll understand what that is. So that is exists in my historian. If I'm a, you know, say that I'm a um, part of an MES that is doing recipe management, and I push that um, push that information, that's how that information is going to get exchanged. I'm not going to send it to that tag per se. I'm going to send it to my um, overall unified namespace model or data model that's associated with it. Does that answer the question? Yep, you're muted. So let's get uh, it. Yes, actually, that was very quick. good. I, that was very good, Dave. I appreciate the uh, that for our listeners and future watchers. Sure, absolutely. That's the downside of watching this, uh, you know, after the fact. It's like you don't get a chance to answer the question, which is why you always want to attend these live. You can answer answer your questions. 
So how do we go about building it? And I think this is one of the, the biggest challenges that people have within a unified namespace architecture is, you know, there's a great question that you asked, Tom, because pretty much everybody knows how to deal with tags. I know how to deal with tags in my PLC. I don't know how to deal with tags in my HMI or my SCADA. I know how to deal with tags in my Astorian. And then as I want to bring in my MES, I'm still working with tags. Well, I'm integrating all the way through there. So that that's the first um, you know hurdle is trying to understand what it is. But then it's also, well, there's there's events that are in this. So how do I actually do events within a unified namespace as well? Because it's a single source of truth for all my data. OK, that's tags, we'll call it. But what about the events? And those are the things that we're going to break into. So I mentioned earlier that we want to create these semantic data models and there are practitioners. So, um, you know, I will give a shout out to uh, 4.0 Solutions and Walker Reynolds. Um, he is the person who has been at the forefront of developing a unified namespace. Um, he actually has three different models that he creates. Um, I've sort of ex ex you know, extended that a little bit to where I actually have an asset model. I'm going to have an equipment model. I'm going to have a functional model and then I'm going to have an informational model. So the easiest one to be understood is that is the asset. So we talked earlier about a particular um, a filler or that we're going to start modeling sometimes in a utilities area because this is where people really understand the concept of a, an asset. I have a compressor and on that compressor I have a motor. So those assets I'm now going to model as a motor. So rather than six tags that are associated with, okay, on a motor, I'm going to have my, my three voltages. I'm going to have my current. I'm going to have my speed. Um, I'm going to have maybe I have a vibration sensor on there. Rather than having that information that just exists um, dis dis disparately, I'm going to have those in a, a pump in a semantic data model that says, excuse me, I'm a motor. And then that motor is actually driving that compressor. And on that compressor, you're going to have my in-feed or my inlet temperature, my outlet temperature. I'm going to have flows. I'm going to have pressures, um, you know, all the other information that's there. So that's now another data model that's going to be created around that asset. So rather than looking at all of those various tags, we're going to create um, the asset model. Um, in this case, I've used a motor and a compressor. I've, I've used that one all the time. We also have equipment model. So as I mentioned earlier of the ISA 95 standard, you know, this is role based. So we're actually going to create models around our equipment. So maybe there's a filler model and within that filler, there's going to be certain pieces of data that we want to ensure that we have for all of our role based equipment. So one of a, a common um, metric that you're going to have in a um, in, in a filling equipment or on a line is you're going to be calculating OEE. So for all of our um, equipment based uh, equipment or, or yeah, that, that made a lot of sense for all of our equipment based um, data models that we create, I always want to have uh, for calculating OEE. I want to know what's the state, what's my in feed, what's my out feed, what's my reject, and then what's the actual calculation of that OEE for that particular line. So that every time I have the concept of a line anywhere in my enterprise, I'm always going to have that type of information that's going to be included. That's that's that equipment based um, data model that exists there. So the functional data model, that's all around a calculation or an event. So the calculation, um, you know, I mentioned OEE earlier. Well, every 60 seconds in many systems, I'm going to calculate OEE. So I'm going to take the line counters that I uh, referenced earlier and I'm not going to, to calculate what is my OEE based on that state, based on what that count is, and those three values that I get. So your availability, your performance, and your quality, and multiply those together and getting OEE. I'm now going to publish that back to that unified namespace so that on the line, not only do I get my raw counts, I can see what is the overall performance of the line. Uh, maybe I'll have my um, uh, from a, another system, I don't know what my product code is. I'm going to know what my work order is. Um, you know, that's all the information that goes in, um, you know, to to making this this particular calculation. And then finally, there's the informational one. So this is um, I'll commonly use these for, um, you know, developing a screen. So one of the tricks that we often use is that rather than creating one HMI screen statically that, you know, now if I have a different screen, I have to create a screen for every view. I can actually parameterize these because I can use a uh, an information data model that I have created dynamically to uh, populate that screen. The reason why this is important, remember, this is the single source of truth for data and events. I want to know what's the operator looking at on the screen. And if I'm historizing all that information, I can see exactly what was presented on that screen because that's an event. I looked at a screen 
And that's how you want to get that information captured in there. And so these are really the four semantic data models that um, are created. I'll actually have examples here, but you know, real fast, um, any questions on, on what it is we're trying to do here? All right, cool. So I, I referenced earlier, you notice I said compressor and I had motor. Well, there's a reason for that. So the asset model that I'll typically work with in creating a uh, unified namespace, uh, you can see on the screen, um, looking at that overall structure so you can say I, I follow that my my equipment my role-based equipment model so i have my enterprise my site the area that i'm in and here's utilities i'm in my compressors and I now created a data model for my compressor that has my uh, flow my pressure my temperature my vibration on it i also have a namespace that is for my motor so that's that current speed and vibration that i have here um, what I also demonstrate here and the tool that I'm using to create all these uh, screenshots is uh, inductive automation, a product called Ignition. Um, it is a, you know, first and foremost, it's a SCADA platform, but because it connects to databases and has APIs, um, it gets used as a platform for um, our, um, you, know, di you know, digital transformation and, and all of the, uh, it's an IIoT platform, so we can create all that. Um, I also take advantage of parameters. So I use tags for my dynamic data, and then I'll use parameters for, you know, what's the area, what's the site, you know, I give some information around what's my the manufacturer, what's the model of this particular compressor. Um, I'll do the same thing with the motor as well, but I'm expanding on that, that to give you an idea of this is all the information that is now presented. So rather than just having all of those disparate tags, you know, in a tag based system, I can actually look at this data and know exactly what it is that I'm looking at. And honestly, if I expanded out that data even more, I'd actually see what my engineering units are. If I have mins and maxes, um, when's the last timestamp that, you know, when, when's the last time that this tag updated that type of thing. But this is an asset model. Um, most people are familiar with like OSI Pi. They have their asset framework, these types of things. That's exactly what it is we're doing here, which is why oftentimes we'll start with asset models. Then we get into the equipment models. So I you know, referenced earlier, we have the enterprise set area line cell. You know, following that same uh, role-based equipment model, we're going to have an enterprise site. We're in an area here, and this is where I'm now going to have a line-based um, uh, UNS or a data model. So I referenced earlier, I'm going to have some OEE counts. So for every line type object that I have, the data that I want to ensure that I get is my end feed. I want to have my mode, which is what's the equipment supposed to be doing. Um, I have an out feed. Um, I also have what's my scheduled rate, which is when I schedule this product or schedule this production, you know, how many should I assume I'm going to get knowing there's going to be some downtime events, but then my standard rate, I know I should be able to do more. So I'm going to have that information. Uh, so the standard rate is how I'm going to actually calculate OEE. I want to know what is the actual state. Um, I give it a state enumeration because one can mean something different for every system. So I want to know, okay, one means running in this particular context. Um, I also have waste or reject. Um, you'll also notice that there is uh, a couple of other, there's a run OEE and a shift OEE and a work order. Those are functional namespaces that um, will get called out a little bit later. Um, and you can see in the information on the right, that's where I have a cell. And on that particular cell, I also have say in feed and some state, but I also have a CMMS tag. That's another functional that actually is related to a work order that might exist um, in that particular case. Um, and you can see that I also have CRM, ERP that exist um, in this data model. Those were actually each site themselves had that, that data space. So a little bit more of a challenge to understand. Any questions, uh, thoughts, or comments on the equipment model that gets created? So now we get into the functional models. So I mentioned earlier that we're going to have run OEE and a shift OEE. Well, this is a calculation that is occurred that is occurring from a there's an OEE engine that's running. So one of the MES tools that I use is my OEE. So because my line model has all of the information that I need, all of my OEE information becomes very easily because I can now parameterize the connectivity to what data do I need to consume and it makes it very easy to replicate what I've done here but I'm going to have a run OEE which is based on um, when I started running this particular uh, product code so in this case we're running um, RJ5000 on this particular line and you can see all of the actual counts that are associated with the run so it's not the raw count that's coming from the line it's actually the counts of my in feed out feed and reject 
um, or, or waste that are associated with um, this particular product run, but I can also have my shift OEE that's available as well. Now, it doesn't have the context of the product code because um, it will, you know, there are multiple product codes that are being written, but this is that, that functional based on there's a calculation that's going on. Um, on the right, I mentioned earlier that there is that CMMS that is a downtime event that in this particular case on my cell one that I need to clear the jam from the inlet of the cell. So my CMMS, um, in this case, I use a product called Upkeep. Um, their CMMS, I have an API call that bring, that returns a data set that I then enumerate and you can uh, get all the information of you know, what is the downtime event that occur that is occurring on this particular line and it gives you that information. So because of this single source of truth for data and events, I can see I have a downtime event based on my state, and then I can also see is there an active work order, and I can in real time see, oh, yeah, there's a work order number, and, and typically there's somebody that's assigned to it. So this is a, a functional model. You also have, um, you know, so I've here, I've ex, um, actually demonstrated what a downtime, you have material movement. So this is one of those I've received loading um, from a, a um, you know, I've received some new material into the plant and I'm going to get things like um, lot information, how much of it was it, what's the product code, um, you know, who brought that information or who is our supplier for all this. So that information becomes in a data model that when that event occurs, um, that's um, that event is then uh, uh, published to a unified namespace. I can also get calibration. So this is um, since we're part of ISA, you know, our roots are the Instrument Society of America. When I calibrate an instrument, I can have now my uh, the asset model that I'm using for all of my calibration that actually gives me information of as found, as left, who's the technician, the date, you know, all that information then gets that's presented. So whenever these types of things occur, um, or there's a scale calibration, that functional model, that event is published to a unified namespace, and that's now readily consumable. So if all of a sudden I was looking um, back and we had a, you know, where this becomes powerful is that if I have a, a quality issue, I can also look to see hmm, when's the last time that particular instrument or that scale was calibrated and becomes very easy for you to access this information because it's all presented um, in a way that makes sense. And then, of course, we have the informational model. So I'll use this for HMI screens. I'll also use it for populating dashboards because it's very you know, it's easy to dynamically create those. Um, I can also use those for reports. So you can see her on the on the left screen. Um, I have a dashboard OEE. So I'm actually doing a, 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 a an OEE calculation in this case. I'm getting what my OEE um, and my APQ values are. And that information is then used on a particular screen. So if I'm on line one versus line two, um, I can, as I'm, as I'm viewing this information, I can, I can um, have that data pointer, if you will, um, coming from line two. It makes it very easy to calculate what's there. Um, on the right side, that's actually a, uh, it's a dynamically rendered screen so that whenever an operator is, uh, you know, working with a particular screen or, or you know, looking at it, that is built at runtime. And so there's some scripting that's done that actually populates that data. The power of this is that you end up with the exact same data model, but you can also, as I mentioned earlier, you know exactly what the operator was looking at at that time because all this information is historized and it's now readily viewable of what was going on at a particular time of this event. Um, so those are the four different data models, but that's how all this information gets put together. Um, we start with modeling assets, we then model equipment, we get into the functions and the events, um, or calculations and events, and finally there's just information. How is this information presented back out? But these four different types of models, that's what make up a unified namespace, so that all my data, all my events are captured in a semantic data model. Um, so that any event that occurs that, you know, it, it can be readily understood. It's the real time state of the business, if you will. So any questions about a UNS and how that gets put together? Love the contextualization of data to become, like you say, information mm -hmm. that can become the, you know, absolute truth. And so we we need to rely on that. And I, I like the way this is going, Dave. I'll, I'll reserve any other comments until we get through the demo. And <laughs> yeah, the we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I should say this isn't a live demo. That's like you never want to do a live demo. So I grabbed, I oh, captured sure. screenshots, yeah, of, of everything that's there. But 
you know, with a little bit of hand waving, believe that that's exactly how I got this data. And if you don't believe me, I have this lab behind me, which is, you know, I have a whole lot of equipment that actually provided me with that. So here's how you want to connect your intelligence to technology. So people are probably very familiar with the converged plant-wide Ethernet. Um, my understanding of this diagram was that Rockwell and Cisco got together and they decided this is how we're going to apply 62443 to the Purdue reference architecture and we're going to bring all this information together. And when I look at the screen, it is an eye chart, but in it is their position that as you are connecting all of your systems together, you know, through Ethernet, through the blue hose, as I call it. This is how you want to do it to make sure that you're maintaining um, the security of all of your data that nothing can get in. And this is creating all your zones, all your conduits that that is talked about within the 62443 standard of how the data flows. Um, so I just wanted to, to uh, you know, present this so that people say, OK, now I understand what somebody is talking about. There is a variation that was put together by uh, Energy Aspects, Paul, or excuse me, uh, Tom, maybe you're familiar um, with this particular company. So this is this diagram here is taking that um, that uh, converged plant wide Ethernet and, and distilling it down to something that's a little more maybe a little more uh, easily understood, but the idea is you're going to have your engineering, your technology, um, you're going to have uh, you know, any type of, uh, of data systems or your, all your you know, plant level information, all that information is connected together and, and how you actually want to um, segment everything out. So you're going to have all your VLANs and firewalls and you, know, you can see all of the information that goes into how do we create that taking the 6443 standard and applying it into a Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture. When we take this same concept but then we bring in a the concept of a unified namespace. What you end up with is that we're still going to have all the Purdue um, Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture um, levels that are associated with it, but we're going to uh, uh, ex extrapolate those utilizing the idea that okay, this is my level four data. I still want to have that data segmented. I want to use VLANs. I still want to have all of the segments but I'm going to take a look at it. This is my level four system. Here's how I'm going to apply it so that the information that, it, that is uh, created to so all of the intelligence that is created throughout um, the overall enterprise, I'm able to keep it secure, but I'm also able to get it to move a lot, a lot, uh, a lot faster, a lot easier. So I'm still keeping the levels and the segments, but I'm approaching it from a, this is just level three data and I'm going to bring that into the UNS. So I'm going to apply all these other, you know, the, the standards that are to it, but I want to focus on the level of the data, not how all of it moves together. So it makes it a lot easier to, um, you know, to understand and digest of what's happening here. So rather than having all the, you know, the firewalls and the VLANs and that type of thing, we just want to look at it from what's a level of the data that's associated with it. So when we start connecting intelligence, we want to take a look at what are the minimum technical requirements. So as you start, you know, we want to architect this event driven um, architecture and we want to utilize a unified namespace. As we start to pick technologies, what are the things that we want to look for? Well, first of all, you want it to be, um, you know, it's open, lightweight, report by exception and edge driven. So open means that we play well with others. And that means that we no longer want to have this information or this data that you can no longer get. And I'm sure you've all run into situations where I can't access the data on this piece of equipment. The provider, the OEM, they've locked that down. I can't get at it. One of your minimum technical requirements for anything that you purchase in the future, it needs to be, um, you need to have that data open. I need to be able to uh, get information out of that. So, you know, gone are those days if you can't do it. And I also don't want to use any kind of proprietary standards for how I want to get all that data communicating. It needs to be open. I need to follow a standard you know, architecture, whether it's an API call or a SQL query or utilizing, you know, I mentioned earlier MQTT. I want all that to be open. I don't want to have to pay for accessing my data. So it needs to be open. Um, it needs to be lightweight. 
And that's where we get into we want to minimize data on the wire. Remember, we're going to be exponentially adding the amount of data that's going to be uh, published and, and consumed um, by the overall um, by the enterprise. We don't want to, uh, to uh, bog down the overall technology you know, your that the network uh, infrastructure and your plant. There's only so many ones and zeros that can go through that blue hose. We don't want to ensure that we're minimizing the amount of data there. So as you're doing this data exchange, you want to ensure that the data um, is, is a lightweight uh, communication protocol. Um, I mentioned earlier event driven architecture. It's, it's report by exception. You only want to um, present new information or new data when the data changes. And so I always liken this to the when we go back to the family vacations, you know, what's the most common question that is asked on a family vacation? Are we there yet? That is poll response because there's no new information, but I'm still communicating. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Versus that report by exception, which is, hey, kids, we're about 10 minutes from grandmother's house. Start collecting your stuff. Put your shoes on. We'll be there soon. That's report by exception. There's new information, and it also means we need to act upon this new information. There's We're getting new information. That means we're going to have to do something with it, or chances are we will. And then finally, edge driven. And this means by, I, I talked earlier about as the device, as the producer of this intelligence, I know what intelligence I have. I know how it should be presented. Um, and I know what the overall architecture, you know, this might, what, what is my namespace? What should it look like? Because I know where I exist within the overall framework of the enterprise. You know, if I were in, a, you know, following that equipment model, I know where that information exists. So edge driven means that I should instantiate my connection. I should give you my data. I should give you the data in a way that is going to be most readily consumable by other systems. And so that's what's meant by the edge driven. Um, so if you when you start looking at new equipment and new technologies, these are the minimum technical requirements that you want to have for all of the you know the producers and consumers of of the data. So there's there's the the one aspect is how data um, is 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 flowing back and forth, but I also want to have um, technology of how do I get everything connected. So one of the things that is that is powerful about using an event driven architecture in this technology is that I can have client instantiated connections. So I talked earlier about how an OPC server will always do a pull response um, to the overall data. Well, in order for me to get for an OPC server to gain access to that PLC, um, I have to actually um, the server itself is what instantiates that connection. Well, in this case, we want to actually have the client. We want to have that producer, that PLC, instantiating that connection, um, and which is completely opposite of, of whatever is, you know, how we've traditionally done that. But the, the benefit of it is that if I'm now going from, say, my level two to my level one system, I no longer have to open a port because now it's my client that is going to be pushing that data in, you know, from that level one into the level two. So it's it's client instantiated connections, but you don't want to um, open any inbound ports from a, a, a higher level. You know, clearly you're going to have to have open ports from a lower level. But generally speaking, and I'm going to wave some hands here, your lower level technology you want to keep most secure. So this is where you get into some inherently um, secure technology. You also want to uh, have the uh, the concept of authentication. Whether this is uh, Active Directory or OAuth or you know any one of those, you want to ensure that there is you know a username and a password that is associated with you know authenticate who you are, what is your identity um, within the overall organization. So you want to apply that and ensure that as much of your technology as you can has some kind of authentication to where it it can no longer acts or you know before it can actually connect to everything. So. Um, in the context of a broker, um, there's a uh, there's a a, um, a a username and a password that is associated with um, you actually making that connectivity because then there's also role based um, um, connectivity on what you're then as as that particular user as that identity of this data um, what you're allowed to publish and what you're allowed to subscribe to, um, which gets you into the uh, authentic uh, authorization. So once you've authenticated now is what it's, uh, is it that you are allowed to do? So within the context of an MQTT broker, what are the topics that you can publish to? What are the topics that you can subscribe to? Can you publish? Can you subscribe? And then as a user on the other side, you know, when I authenticate into a particular system where it's SCADA or MES or ERP, 
what are the rules? What are the things that I'm allowed to do with that particular data? Um, so you want to have that authorization in there as well. You always want to use encryption. So it's the data at rest, data in transit. So you always want to, in a very um, easy sense, you always want to encrypt all of your hard drives or all your storage is encrypted. So if somebody physically gains access to that storage, they can't do anything with it. Or whenever you are communicating and has data or you have data that's in transit, you also want to utilize, say, TLS in this case, to where the data that's traversing that particular wire that's also encrypted so that if somebody would to gain access to that network, they're not going to be able to gain access to that particular data. So you want to ensure that you're applying encryption in this case. Um, Multi-factor authentication is, um, is part of that, that authentication authorization process. So any of my um, RDP, my remote desktop sessions that I create, anytime I access secure shell on these devices, um, I have, you know, for my network, I have um, Active Directory, but I have to also use a, a multi-factor authentication. I can't access anything. And then finally, logging. You want to have a big um, data storage for logging so that anytime there is an event or anything that's going on, um, that any, any type of information, anything, an event that occurs on that particular device, you want to make sure that you're getting that data logged. So not only do you want to have a, the uh, open lightweight report by exception edge driven in the, uh, the technology, you want to also apply I want connect, you know, I, I want client instantiated connections, no inbound ports. I need to be able to use authentication with a multi-factor you know, authorization. I would need to be able to encrypt it, and I also need to be able to have some kind of data logger so I can go back in. And there's there's always that that history and audit log, if you will, um, everything that's occurring. So those are the MTRs. Any questions on that? So what I've attempted to do in this architecture is that this is this is my lab in in, in a in a simplistic in the application that we're going to look at. So I have my internet that's you know starting from the top left and, and coming all the way down. You know, imagine this is that I've now created my my own enterprise or my my manufacturing site. So I'm going to have the internet. I'm going to come in through a firewall. I'm now going to have a router that it's actually not a wireless router. It's just a, a non-antenna router. And then I'm going to create VLANs right away. So my VLAN one, we'll consider that that's like the enterprise side of the business. So I'm going to have my application server that sits there. All the applications there, you know, might be a SQL server, might have my, uh, you know, there might be, you know, there could be all kinds of applications that are running there. This could be my Active Directory. Um, this could be my, if I have a local based, uh, you know, CRM or ERP, that type of information is now going to sit on the business side. And any port that I have coming in to um, or that's open is either going to be on that VLAN one. Actually, I don't have it represented here. There's a completely the only inbound ports I have are sitting on a completely separate VLAN that nothing else talks to. So if you were to gain access, you're only going to be able to see that information. On the right side of this diagram, that's where you're going to get into that that OT side of the business. There's no ports that are open to it. Anything that needs to get out to the internet is going to be going through. Um, it's going to be an outbound instantiated only. So on my VLAN 4, that's going to be where I'm going to have an application server, where I'm going to have another domain controller for my uh, authentication or uh, an app, excuse me, an active directory or some type of authentication service sitting there. Might have, you know, again, another SQL server. Um, and this is a, a point of conversation um, that you could have that application server being a replica of the um, your Active Directory or your author, um, authorization or your authentication server that's running on that enterprise side. And there's certainly arguments either way. Um, for, for all intents and purposes, we're going to say it's isolated in this case. Um, I have my SCADA system, my MES, and I have my data story and it sits there. Um, I'm also going to have some, um, you know, I, I have another switch that's now created some separate VLANs. So now when I go from my, my level um, two and level three systems down to my level one systems where I actually have all the PLCs, I created yet another VLAN. There's also firewalls, so nothing can get in. So those firewalls are all closed. So I don't know if I can um, put on a pencil here, but I think I can get a laser pointer. Oh, look at that. So here in my actual environment, I have some equipment that is more modern, but then more often than not, I'm going to have some equipment that is, 
I don't want to, it's legacy. It's, it's, tr it's traditional equipment that has existed in my plant for a long time. So, you know, we were talking earlier about tags. How do I gain access to say a Siemens or a Rockwell PLC that doesn't meet my minimum technical requirements? Well, in this case, I'm now going to have ignition edge, um, whether that's sitting in my edge gateway or it's included in my Groove Epic. Um, I can use my ignition edge and uh, my transmission where I can subscribe to all of those tags and then I can consume that information and I can publish it into to the higher levels. So what I'm doing here is using Ignition Edge, connecting in using um, you know, its, its device driver. I can create my unified namespace, my, my asset model based on the tags that are here in my equipment model, and I can publish that information out. Or I can now use an easy, um, so getting back to my minimum technical requir requirements, I could decide, I'm going to use Easy Automation. They have their Easy Logics that has Spark Plug. That's uh, that's an MQTT. It's a specific payload that will publish right to you know right from the device itself. So I don't have to use any kind of say Ignition Edge in this case. It supports my minimum technical requirements right away. Um, or the last piece I can use here is my Groove Rio, and there's a couple of ways I can get information out of it. I can either use its native Spark Plug uh, publishing capabilities. Or I can combine this Rio with my Epic that, you know, the Epic actually has two different uh, network cards on it. So one's going to be sitting on my um, my control side and the other one's going to be sitting in um, on my PLC side um, to where now I can actually talk right to that PLC or talk right to that Groove Rio utilizing the Opto MMP. So there's several ways that I can get data out of there. But the point is, is that all of that information sits on its own control, um, on its own control uh, VLAN, and there's nothing that's inbound um, to that information. I also have a Chariots um, broker that's sitting here. So Chariots, one of the MQTT brokers, um, it's by Cirrus Link. So I'm also going to have a broker that's sitting down here. So this information, if it needs to, it can pass information back and forth. So if there's uh, you know, one of the PLCs or one of my control systems needs to get that data, I'm now keeping that, that information isolated. That's all of that information that really exists at that control layer. I'm going to keep it there. And then only information that needs to get promoted into a different uh, layer of the business um, will be, um, you know, that will occur either through this ignition edge that's running here on the gateway or the ignition edge that's running here on, on that Groove Epic. Now, this becomes part of a cybersecurity posture because there's a couple of different examples that I'll show you. One where I actually do open up a port down to this edge gateway so that my SCADA system is actually going to be subscribing to this broker down here as well. That depends on your security posture if you're okay with doing that. Otherwise, you're going to have to take this data that exists here at this broker and you're actually going to have to repackage it and then present it up um, higher. So that's what you're seeing here by the uh, the ignition edge and the ignition transmission um, that sits down at this layer. And then once that information is up here on my VLAN 4, that information is now can now be um, consumed. So I have a canary of storing that consumes that data um, because I also have another uh, broker that's sitting here on my SCADA. My ignition can consume it, my MES, my, um, which in this case is Cephasoft, and my canary can all um, can all access that information. So by virtue of just me creating new intelligence here, it's now available to all these systems just by virtue of I've now connected it into my technology into my MQTT. So did I explain this? Is this making sense to what I'm doing here so far? Okay. The, the point is, is that I got firewalls. There's no data that, or there's no inbound ports that are being open. Everything is client instantiated. All of this is presenting itself up to higher levels. So let me get rid of my pointer and hopefully I can just click out. All right, I'm going to move this out of the way. What, uh, so, what are you using for a firewall device or what's an example of something it would be used in a system like this? So in, when I say the firewall here, this is all software firewall. So on the Groove Epic, there is a firewall that comes with it to where that I can now determine what services is are available on the various different, um, um, uh, the control layer. So all of my level four, you know, other than getting information that I, you know, I need to go in and do some, um, uh, I need to access the, uh, um, the development environment so I can just, configurations for what I'm gonna access, but anything that's controls related, those are all closed off. 
Um, the group also has the ability to do some port forwarding. So that's one of the ways that I can gain access is that I can interrogate this side of my Groove Epic. Um, and then I can just, just say, OK, well, if it comes in on this particular port, we're now going to send it down to, you know, say you have a Rockwell PLC. I can actually hit a rock or hit a port on the on, on the, uh, the the VLAN 4 side. So I'm on my 4 subnet that will then um, use port forwarding. It's sort of like a reverse proxies is sometimes they're called. Um, on this one, I'm just utilizing, um, this is a Linux uh, based product. I'm using like, uh, utilizing UFW so that all of the data that is being presented here, it's all closed off. And, but, and, and, and also uh, Grant as a shameless plug for what Dunwoody uses and what we had, what Paul Wienemann and I had in our recent uh, industrial critical function security track, uh, we had a sponsor of Fortinet and they yeah. produce some good products that uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately they've also been tagged by CISA as having some vulnerabilities, but what doesn't? Um, so it's a matter of being able to understand what the vulnerabilities are and working around them or updating the firmware on if they have firmware and, and stuff like that. But Fortinet has some great industrial products that uh, um, I would look at. Yeah, so I'm using a software firewall. It absolutely could be a, higher, a hardware firewall. The advantage of using product like, say, Fortinet, and this is you know our position on the technology, is that you make it as easy to connect and get data moved around as you can, and then you utilize tools that have you know some kind of AI there or, or a, something that's looking at the wire all the time to see what is the data that's moving around. And if I see something that, wow, that's unusual, I don't usually see that type of information coming from that particular um, uh, source or going to that particular destination, I should probably check that out. Um, so when I was talking earlier about um, you know, how I have the system architected, um, I'd forgotten that I added in this slide. So this expands a little bit more of, here's my area broker, here's my site broker, where all this information uh, is being presented. So that way, any information that is you know, part of my packaging system, all of you know, my various lines, all my lines can talk to each other, but they don't necessarily have to um, go to other parts of the business. So it's a good way of keeping everything segmented um, out there. But like I said, you know, Siemens, I have to connect to with Ignition. Um, my um, Easy Logics has Spark Plug. My Rio, I can either use Spark Plug or I can take advantage of utilizing that with the, the Groove Epic. So the Rio is a, is a remote IO, as the name would suggest. And then in this case, the Epic would be the, um, the PAC. Um, uh, the programmable uh, automation controller that you know utilizes. I can have a lot of different Rios out there. So the, there's some options that I created here. So the first one is I'm now going to utilize my Alto 22. This is data as it comes from my Groove Epic. Within a Groove Epic, you can see that this uses a strategy. So what a strategy is is that if you're familiar with doing PLC programming, this is the actual what is the program that is running that I'm constantly going through and looking at what is the data? It gets called a strategy. So from that strategy, I can get all of my analog and all of my discrete data. So these are all the PLC tags that are coming from my, um, right out of my, um, my Epic. And I can present that into the, you know, this is now being consumed by that site broker. And this is what that data would look like. So the Epic that's um, sitting there, it has, um, it's connected to other systems and it's now publishing its data um, just right out using its native um, spark plug um, payload coming out of there. And this is what it would look like. So now we just have tags. We don't actually have the semantic data model. Um, line one using the second option is that we're actually going to use, instead of the strategy, we're now going to separate out. So I mentioned earlier that I have the Epic and the Rio that are both um, presenting information. So in this case, I can have all of those channels um, are just coming natively from the Epic. So rather than you know publishing its overall strategy, which includes everything, I'm now just going to give you the raw data um, that, that comes from that. And this is what the Rio looks like. But again, these are coming from the uh, the native, uh, or you know, this is what it looks like at the this um, at the site broker itself. 
Um, now, what's happening here, as I mentioned earlier, is that my Rio is actually publishing its information into the area broker. So I'm just going up real fast. It's publishing its information here. I've actually opened a port for it to subscribe to that data. This is, becomes a posture of, am I okay with doing something like that? I am opening a port, but I'm opening up a very specific port that only gain, that gives me access to a data broker. So that that just becomes a, a decision point there. But that's what, that's what it would look like. And that's why I mentioned that the SCADA connects to the error broker, that there is a point um, port that is open. So in this case, so all my, my opto equipment is all on line one, you know, on my line two, this is where I now have my, um, my automation, my easy logics is now going to uh, subscribe into my, uh, my area broker. Uh, and again, I'm also going to have my uh, SCADA connect, you know, same, same type of way, but that's what this information looks like. So I've now created intelligence uh, down on my control layer. I'm presenting it into my area broker. And then of course my SCADA system is connecting to the area broker uh, much the same way. The other option, and this is what I've done, is I actually now take advantage of the transmission that I have running on that edge gateway. So let me run back up here to the diagram. So now on this edge gateway, I actually have a, an ignition edge instance that's gonna consume the data that's being presented from um, on this uh, chariot broker by my two spark plug supported devices, I'm going to model it, and then I'm going to present that information um, to the uh, ignition edge that's sitting now on my, or my ignition system, you know, that's part of my SCADA system. So now you can see that I have in my South Park plant, in my packaging area, I have line one, which is gonna be my Rio, and you can see that folder is sitting there that has those tags, and my line two is now my Easy Logics device. So, um, you know, I, I have it all, uh, it, it's basically the raw data that's coming uh, from that line, but now I'm starting to put that information together in context. The advantage of doing this is that I don't have to open a port. The downside to this is that I now need another software license so I can consume that data um, right there on the device itself. <coughs> excuse me, from on my VLAN 8, my control LAN, and then publish that into my SCADA. Um, the next one is, is on uh, line three. So I'm using the same equipment here, but in, in this case, we're gonna say that my Opto 22 and another application, this is sitting on line three, that I'm going to use my ignition edge that has my uh, Opto driver. So all the uh, Opto, um, so my Rio and my Epic, I can now consume that information, but I can actually start creating data models from it. So you mentioned earlier about um, Tom, about how do I take all of my tag data? So I'm actually mapping this. Um, so I'm creating a binding to that raw tag. So when we looked here at that opto let discrete and analog, <coughs> excuse me, I should have grabbed some water here. Um, I'm now starting to create my semantic data model. So now my filler, I have you know, my filler is my Rio. I have uh, filler nozzle one and filler nozzle two. And then my main controller for my line um, is going to be my uh, Epic. And you can see here that I have my, um, you know, do I have an alert? You know, so my discrete, my analog um, measurements that I'm getting, that's that's related to now alerts, a primary variable and a set point. The advantage to this is that, you know, on my, my uh, Ethernet um, one, I'm connected to all of my plant floor equipment on Ethernet zero. That's the one that's connected to the control system. I get the data modeled and present that up. Um, and this is what it looks like, you know, in this case on line four, um, this is where I have my S7-1200. Um, I'm using that same ignition edge. I'm creating an asset model of a particular motor. Um, it connects to the site broker, so it's it's publishing that information, um, but the data gets modeled right away. So, and this would be just a, a standard, you know, control al algorithm coming off of a, of a motor itself. Um, and the models that I'm demonstrating here were just, that's what I happened to have on the S7-1200 for another um, demo that I was doing for somebody. So these are the various ways that you can start connecting all of the, um, all that information together. So now trying to bring everything, you know, all the way um, together, you can see here at my, you know, my enterprise, you know, my line one, I'm now um, subscribing to all this information. I have all of my raw data that's coming from my assets. And then I also have my um, equipment model. That's a part of this. Um, one of the things I didn't show, these are some material movements. So I have material ins and then I also have material out. that's coming from there, but this is what a site UNS would look like, which you can see in this overall, um, you know, putting everything together. 
I have asset models, I have equipment models, I have some functional models, and I have some informational models um, that are associated with uh, everything that I've put together here. And this SOC, that's your standard operating condition. So those are all the set points um, that are associated with it. That's bringing it all together. So any questions that you guys have? Well, you guys know me, so I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to leave the floor open. So uh, I'll let you guys squeeze some in. OK. Oh, you got to unmute there, Grant. So is there any synergy between especially the modern controllers and all of these systems where you can access the tags and not have to enter stuff in? And and with the legacy systems, is there any any synergy there also with, you know, I keep thinking. You know, the the way the tags are naturally. Here and not there <laughs> you know in some cases i know you have to type just to make it part of the standard but is there any import routines so in terms of how we get data connected so i will i'll reference here um if i were to add a new tag on this easy logics that information would be dynamically published so just by virtue of adding that tag and saying, yes, I want this to publish. That's all it takes to do that. Where this becomes powerful is that as I've created different lines here, let's see if I can get back to my line namespace. Yeah, it'll be easier to so show earlier. So I apologize for all the, 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 the screen clicks. So if I've done my equipment model, you can see or hear that I have lines one. I guess I'm going to have to use my laser pointer again so that it can be seen. If I've done my data models right and I've mapped my. My overall asset tags correctly, creating lines two and three are just a matter of copying and pasting those lines because I parameterized. You notice here there's this thing called line number. Oddly enough, line two has that parameter of line number two. So in terms of as I create new tags, how is that information presented? The idea is that if I've done this correctly, it's just by a matter of that intelligence is just created and it's now readily accessible through the rest of the enterprise. So, so I guess I'm thinking more of on the edge situations where I've got a PLC and getting those tags up into your first instance of the smart system and then on the other side oh, getting sure. your tags into the mes system so in terms of getting you know once once one of the hardest parts of doing this is that now now i need to get my asset my actual tags mapped into a, a corresponding tag into my IOT platform. In this case, it's going to be ignition. So there is some work that's associated with that. If the person that did the PLC programming followed a common naming um, convention, it makes it a lot easier to get that information back because then you can parameterize this. So um, a particular line that I was working in, um, their plastic extruder, um, they followed a naming convention for the OPC server that literally once I went to the other, there's six lines there. I did one of them when I went to the other five. It was literally just a matter of changing the address of the equipment itself. And that's that's how that was taken care of. It was then available to all other parts of it. So even in this case, I'm using Cephasoft um, for the NES because I'd also parameterized my equipment model in Cephasoft. Um, I was actually able to let's see, do I have a line? Yeah, right here at the end. So this line UNS, um, because that's an equipment model, I have the equivalent function of Cephasoft because it's also parameterized because what I've told it is go into my line one folder and then capture my line one tag. Um, actually, I call this line, um, you know, that, that Pretend this one isn't here. I'm going to cover it up right now. <laughs> I now have a line namespace that maps to those tags. So literally how everything gets consumed, if I created my namespace correctly, it's now more readily accessible. It's a lot of work up front 
And this is that modeling at the edge is what it's the concept of model everything as quickly as you can so that now it's a lot more um, accessible by other systems. You know, your uh, grant asked a very, very good leading question as to where I was going to go with a couple of sets of questions. Because you talk, you've made some statements about there's some work to do here in when you're setting up and doing the architecting. And so, and, and Grant was going from how to update a legacy system or how to map this into a legacy system. If you're going to either tag, tag you're going to add a new line, or you're going to add a new division to the company, and you want to begin using this kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about where you're going to teach this, David, other than just what you're doing in your standard business development? Because E.J. Daigle, of course, is a, a dean and now an interim dean of engineering at Dunwoody College of Technology, and he's overseeing a new computer science program that is really still kind of IT focused. Mm -hmm. I, along with some others, are trying to nudge him toward more OT. Mm -hmm. This might help explain to them how to do that. And then also how to build some curricula, because it would be a couple of different um, where to insert it, maybe in a PLC programming. Here is one way you could start thinking about doing your programming. How to, how to make it more user uh, effective in an, both from an architectural standpoint as well as down to asset equipment function and information that you want to get out of the system and so yeah. i'm asking i'll go back to the question the leading question was have you thought about how and where you're going to teach it because i think i would recommend you to ej to do help them put a program together so i am working with our local high school um, i go in every year for our career day at our middle school and I'm also talking to a local techni technical college around what are the things you need to know as an OT professional? And it's a pretty extensive list. It's not just programming languages 61131. I need to know SCADA. I need to know MES. I need to know ISA standards. I need to know databases. I need to know operating systems. There is a pile of stuff that you really need to know how to do. Um, so that's where I'm getting it connected, um, or th that's where I'm getting plugged in. More than happy to um, you know, teach these classes, um, you know, with people that so they understand how to do it. Because yes, there's a lot of legacy out there. You need to create. There's a whole, you know, steps of how do you digitally transform inventory, um, the business inventory intelligence connect all your data, build your unified namespace. That's where you start putting in all these semantic data models of what are my assets going to look like? What is my equipment going to look like? And then start getting into more of the functions um, and, 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 and calculations that need to be done. Um, so th there's a methodology for doing these types of things. But coming up with those those edge models, that's where there's there's a lot of work in doing that because there's a lot of legacy data that's there. Create that that model. So there's a, a product called uh, Highbyte, um, and they make their well the company is Highbyte, their intelligence hub. That's exactly what it's designed to do. One of its first things that it does is actually get to a Kep server uh, to Kepware, and you can start creating those asset models. But uh, once you go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, yeah. So, so, my, so one of my questions would be, you know, are we are we tagging stuff in the PLCs wrong right now? I mean, so if I'm looking at a system where I have two tanks, let's say, and I've got a, I've got a number using my Emerson example from our lab there, Tom, yep. and I've got a let's say a pump, and I've got a you know a, a level, and I've got temperature, and I've got flow, and I've got all of these things on tank number one, and I've got similar tags on tank number two. Should I be tagging those as kind of like you mentioned in the previous example that you were looking at those? Uh, those plastic extrusions or whatever it was, um, you know, should I be tagging those as, you know, tank one temp, tank one flow, tank one this, uh -huh. tank one that? Should I be creating a UDT or something um, uh -huh. for tank one and just having all of those tags fall underneath the tank one UDT rather than having those be discrete tags? 
Yeah, so you'll notice here that I have analog uh, zero through seven. I have inputs zero through seven, then I have discretes zero through I think 29. But in this, you know, how I'm actually utilizing that is that as I've created these SOCs, the alert primary variable and set point, one of them is an output, one of them is an input, and one of them is the discrete. I've actually created a parameter that corresponds to its number. Gotcha. Is how I've done that. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, and it's it's you know once you look at it a couple of times, three, four times, you begin to see that it it can help a programmer um, conceptualize what needs to get done uh, because the focus is to contextualize the data that you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of working almost from the end backwards as a lot of, you know, when you do a system, that's part of what the engineering is, right? You're looking at form, fit, and function. And when you're programming a system, you're looking at its function and you're going back to see how it's going to fit. And so it's this, this back and forth and back and forth but you're you're establishing more clarity as you're simplifying your program. Really, mm -hmm. it really simplifies the programming, just like function blocks did. It, what it, it kind of almost reminds program. me. It kind of almost reminds me of you know you go back to like an RS five hundred platform where all of the tags were predefined, right? So so it didn't matter who programmed it. You 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 knew what you know timer one dot acc meant well nowadays people create arrays of tags and they call them whatever the hell they want yeah. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and that becomes a little bit problematic and sometimes they create you know you know six an array of 16 elements and sometimes they create an array of you know four thousand elements or something like that and and it just it, it seems to make it messier as we've given the programmer uh more options to how they want to create their data you know how they want to set up their arrays mm -hmm. within the plc so one of the, the um, oh, adages is that we make no assumptions for how the data is going to be consumed. So and, that, and that's very difficult. So yes, your so data governance is becoming more and more popular of how do we actually ensure that, you know, and enforce that when somebody is going to do a, a PLC program or a DCS program, you know, this is the, one of the toughest things in all of, of uh um, programming and controls is, is naming. What are we going to call the thing? Um, yes. You know, I ran into that of, you know, I, well, EQ path. Okay, that's my equipment path. That one's pretty easy, but you know, I need to create a, a schedule list. Well, what's that? What's going to be called type of thing? So, you know, that becomes, becomes challenging. There's legacy. Then there's how do we do the new things? And this is where you start bringing in the, the data governance. Um, you know, one thing I didn't really show you here, the idea was that here's how I'm securing the system because I'm able to elevate data from lower levels into higher levels and doing it securely. That was the gist here. What I didn't show yeah. you is, you know, bringing it all together. What does this actually look like, you know, outside of this, this SOC, my filler nozzle that I didn't expand, but this is how I'm now getting all of those, you know, bringing in that, that particular data. So this is a standard operating condition zero. I could have, you know, really what I wanted to do was, was call those tags, you know, something that was a little more semantic to where you could look at it. And then as I started consuming those tags, it made it a lot more easy to, you know, turn that into, you know, add, add context as it gets into higher and higher level systems. And, and Dave is, I hadn't asked this question earlier when I when I really wanted to because you you're talking about ISA ninety five. Um, you, when you talk about HMI or HMIs, you're talking I think what is it eighty eight? As um, uh, uh, HMIs are one hundred one. Yeah, eighty eight batch control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So and so you're talking standards. Mm -hmm. Who created the UNS and is there a standard behind it? So there is or no standard. Yet? Um, okay. That that well, and so that becomes a a very long, probably a longer conversation for this. <laughs> it is our contention, you know, within our side of the fence. And I'm, when I say professionally, I, I you know I'm one of the um, you know I'm a principal consultant for for Spruik. We utilize ISA 95. That to us is that semantic data model. Now, what it doesn't cover are things like say your asset models. But once you get into your equipment models, your um, 
you know, all of the you know material models, your personnel models, your asset models, you know, all of those types of things, those those have already been predefined. So as far as we're concerned, the ISA 95 standard does give us it's it's a it's a standard that was developed for connecting our ERP into our control systems. And a UNS for all intents and purposes is how do we connect all of this this data that exists in our OT layer and get it into our business system? So that's our contention. And, um, and I see. Oh, go ahead. F finish up. And I was just going to say, so that's ours. But you'll have others that it's going to vary from company to company based on how they operate their business. Yeah. And, and that's sort of that. You know, th there are some. It, it's a long conversation. Yeah, and and I can see where it would it would uh, it would be modified depending on what your market space is. Mm -hmm. What are you actually producing? Because somebody who's who's in a uh, you know automating um, you're automating a an ability to um, you know uh, create um, roof trusses, and you're automating a roof truss. Mm -hmm. uh, the UNS around the equipment and the and the functions and the lines and cells and whatever else of your automated factory is going to differ from a pharmaceutical company. So yeah, the whole UNS is. thing, right, is mm -hmm. is going to be yeah, modified but, application specific. But I, it gets, I I say yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, so where I was going with this is, um, do you see it changing the way we teach? programming, both the computer science side, as well as the PLC and the OT side. And I'm where I'm coming again from this is the cyber informed engineering um, dynamic that's that's trying to get rolled out from Idaho National Labs, where we need to try and start merging IT and OT training so that it's mm -hmm. cyber informed engineering, 100%. whether you're engineering software or you're engineering hardware systems, or the integration of those two separate um, components. Yeah. So software. within yeah, six eleven thirty one, um, there are different languages you can use: function yep. block, structured text. Yep. You got to know how to learn ladder. I swear, if you are a programmer, PLC programmer, and the first thing you do is, "Yo, oh, I'm going to do this in ladder," you should be just fired right away. Yep. <laughs> structured text with comments. That's what you should be doing, or function blocks, one of the two. Uh, here, here yeah, with yeah. comments. Yeah. Yeah, those ever are the two since I was at Siemens, doing. I've been, uh, pro, you know, promoting six eleven thirty one, and yeah, uh, and, and now it's, you know, what's the new term for it? There's another another version of it. Um, oh, I saw it today, and I can never keep it in my head. Um, it's another European thrust, hmm. but it's effectively six eleven thirty one under another name. Uh, to me, programming is a programmer. Um, so I'm a big believer in CodeSys. Um, CodeSys, only because it. yeah, it's yeah. it's an open, Codesys. it's an open um, six level. There's you know 600 yeah. plus devices that all support it. I yeah. learned how to program one routine. I can now apply it to 600 different pieces of technology, assuming that they can all do that same type of thing. Um, Opto, right. Wago, um, PLC Next. Um, I can write the exact same controls narrative in one IDE, and I can use that. But there, there's the, there's a a way to do structured text there that follows a lot of your same principles of how you program um, and do some things. So it's yeah, level, absolutely. Yeah, it's higher level programming brought down to the hard to the hardware level. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. what it means is that it's enforced. It's also gonna it, it's checking to make sure that you're not gonna do something dumb. I mean, uh, your permissives are your permissives, but it, yes. it's gonna compile a task of work. Um, but it seemed like, oh, so going back to whether you're making roof trusses or pharmaceuticals, ISA 95, you can still create all your models in there. There's always going to be your equipment, your material, your assets, and your personnel, and you're always going to have request objects. You're going to have schedule objects. You're going to have response objects. All of those things exist, and, and you can absolutely publish that, that information back. So is there a standard for a UNS? No. Could ISA 95 be one of those? Yes but there needs to be a better understanding of what ISA 95 is and does. Okay, let's leave it at that. David, if you mm -hmm. put your contact information up as one of the slides, if you've got a slide there. Oh. So no. our <laughs> viewers, the viewers of this later who have questions for you, they can contact you if you're open to that, or if you want it to be a, you know, somebody to come through, they can come through me or come through EJ 
Uh, we'll leave Grant out of this because he's uh, he's got other stuff. <laughs> um, All right. But um, so let me create another slide quickly that you can um, I'll just plop it in. So that sounds perfect. All so right. I still, for one instance, I still like ladder logic, and it's for a, a latching motor circuit. I just think that's just so elegant and more clear. Well, maybe just because I'm old, but more clear than like structured text to do motor control. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, I, 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 I do that. paint with a broad brush, but I've seen some ladder logic. It's like one, what on God's green earth are you doing here? You can't even follow it. You know, yeah. there's a reason why ladder logic was created. It's because you had electricians that were doing um, yeah. PLC programming. So, you know, I actually have done some ladder. Uh, some of those examples were done using ladder. Um, my motor control is actually a, a ladder program because it has that seal in circuit to where yeah. once once I hit the button and my uh, my coil is hot, it seals it in because there's a reference tag to it. So, yeah, yeah I, awesome. I agree. But that that all the programming that I have for all of my, uh, you know, when I wrote those tags, I created one subroutine in Opto, and then I just called it how many ever times for those instances done. Yeah. Right. So Very anyway, cool. there's my contact information. Uh, yeah, it looks good. David, thank you so much. Um, you spoke very quickly. It was clear. I have seen it a couple times, as you know. Um, and so um, looking to help try to spread the word on this, because I yeah. think it's some some very important stuff to do to, you know, as for digitalization of systems to both uh, clarify, contextualize and gain more meaningful data mm -hmm. and understanding it better. So um, let's let's yeah. go out there and try and do that. And I'm sure EJ will be contacting about uh, you know, helping architect uh, uh, maybe a three course block. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. It'd be great. More, more than happy to help put put together what needs to get put together. Um, Love it. I, and I'm with you on the education and teaching that. What you're going to find is that there's some of the incumbents are going to work against this because they're not. That's not how they do it. So no. just be <laughs> just be aware of that. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 That it's it's it can be uh, it can be earth shaking. Or it can be just we're going to creep into your backyard and we're going to put a we're going to plant a garden there and you'll you won't even realize it. it'll just spring up one day and it'll be there. <laughs> as as yeah. I, I mentioned, Coatsis earlier, it's slowly at first, then suddenly all at once. Yeah. So, hey Tom, all yes. very, great information. Thank you. Yeah, great, great job, David.